Well, here we are with chapter four, A Good Foundation. And there's a lot of crossover between chapter four and chapter three. Uh, but it's very important that the foundations are set in place, good foundations. When I was looking at foundations, it felt like it was hard work. It felt a little bit overwhelming. I don't believe that's the right attitude to have, but I remember looking at foundations. And Dr. Keith Jenkins said to me, remember, the, the more you dig, the higher the building will be at the end of the day. Foundations in any building are crucial. It doesn't matter if you try and build your spiritual walk and become super spiritual. It doesn't matter if you try and become what you're called to be uh, immediately after getting saved. It doesn't matter if you rush those things. If those foundations are not set in place, the building at some point, especially when pressure comes, is going to start to wobble, maybe even crumble. So foundations are good. Think about foundations. Foundations you go down first, and that can seem discouraging. I'm looking at all these basics. I'm looking at the foundations. I'm looking at things down here. But that's not discouraging if you understand the process. If you understand what it really means to get a good foundation, then you'll dig and you'll keep digging. The deeper the foundations, the stronger the foundations, the higher your spiritual building is going to be at the end of the day. Now, this is crucial. And it's crucial for every Christian, but it's more important for us to make a, a note of this this week. Because we're looking at a good foundation, we need to look at what Jesus says was the greatest commandment. He said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. Then he said the second greatest commandment is like it. It's to love your neighbour as yourself. Now that's certainly easier than obeying a million different commandments, maybe not a million, but thousands of different commandments of the Jewish law. If we could just release our faith or release our trust, shall we say, into Jesus and recognize we're going to love the Lord with everything we've got. We're going to give him all. We're going to go for this. We're going to be people who love Jesus because he's called us to love him and he's shown his love to us. We're going to love the Lord with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind and strength. Now, I did a study on this and I'm not going to go over that because we're looking at this book but when I first became a believer I quickly discovered that this was the greatest commandment and think about that all your soul all your heart soul mind and strength there's not much left out is there it's to love God with all that with every part of your being with with, with all that you are giving him everything that's the greatest commandment so let's not lose that if you really want to walk with God and you really want to learn to hear his voice so that you can know him then you have to love him with everything you've got. You've got to let go. You've got to say, Jesus, that's it. I give in to you and your love. And I'm going to walk with you like you want me to. I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to embrace the process. I'm going to show you I love you. I surrender in this love relationship. Amen. So let's be people on fire for him. Encourage yourself. Don't listen to the flesh. Don't give the old nature any room to manoeuvre. Just say, this is it. From now on, I am going for him and I'm going to love him with every part of my being. Now in this chapter, which is shorter than others, Joseph again mentions lordship and he gives us a definition of what it means for uh, what the word lord means. Jesus is lord. We're called to submit to him as lord, as our master. And it means supreme in authority. It means the controller, by implication the master including as a respectful title. It means God, Lord, Master, Sir. And a good question to ask yourself now, is Jesus the supreme authority in your life? Is he the supreme authority in your life? The supreme authority is the one that rules for some people. The supreme authority can be finances for some people. Supreme authority can be relationships or another person. The supreme authority in your life should be the Lord Jesus Christ, meaning He's the boss. He's in control. We hear it over and over again through this book. And like last week, we remember that we discovered that Joseph says it's the number one stumbling block for people trying to fellowship or walk with Jesus is that they don't submit to his lordship. So remember, it's clear when we use the term Lord, it's not just a respectful title, although it is a respectful title. It actually means he's our functional master. Amen. Amen. Now, as you're growing and as you learn to be Christ-like, 
There is going to be some conviction along the way. You're going to be challenged in certain areas. The old nature is going to have to die. We've been, we've been told to do that. There's a scripture that tells us to mortify the flesh, kill it, deaden it, you know, kill its desires and be a spiritual person, move into the spirit, be led by the spirit. And as that process is taking place, there is some conviction going to come. Now, one of the things that I notice, and Joseph does mention it, is that people often get offended when they're convicted, they get offended. It's, you know, you may bring, I may, God may allow me to bring a word to someone and say, look, you need to change this. And they don't speak to me for weeks because they're offended. That is really immature. Offence coming because of conviction is just your flesh response. A spiritual response would learn to embrace it. And I'd encourage every single one of you to learn to embrace conviction. It's the only thing that works. Just as a little testimony, I remember when uh, you know I first joined the church that I go to and um, Emmanuel Christian Centre in Ulverston, I first joined the church and I would uh, be convicted and in the beginning it felt like there was lots of things, don't do this, don't do that. It felt, you know, at first it was all, it was all love and joy and, and then, it, then it, after a period of, uh, a smooth period where God was introducing himself and I was bonding with him, then became a sustained kind of period of don't do this, don't do that, repent of this, if you love me, don't do that again. Those kind of things. It felt like everywhere I turned there was an issue that maybe needed dealing with. But I remember what I went through when I went through what I call my breaking. I remembered the love, joy and peace that he had shown. I remember the decision that I made that I want to know him or at least I want to follow him and I'll go anywhere for him and I'll do anything for him. I remember that moment. I remember the, the profound and deep love that he had shown. So when I felt convicted, yes, sometimes in the beginning, uh, for a period of time, I'd go very quiet. As the, and the only reason I'd go quiet is to try and shut that flesh up and stop it reacting. Now I've learned to enjoy it and I learned to uh, um, sort of relish um, conviction as time went on. Um, in fact, I have no problem with conviction. Believe, I have no problem with conviction whatsoever. I do not mind being corrected. I don't mind being told where I'm wrong. Uh, from the right sources. <laughs> Sometimes a lot of people try and tell me where they're wrong, but I mean from the Lord or from those that are responsible for me. I don't mind it. But in the beginning, I had to learn to remember just how loving and how good God is. And I had to embrace that kind of um, attitude. So I would, I would just put my head down. I'd remember the moment that he would that he came to me. I remember that it's not, I'm not trying to please people. It doesn't matter what other people think about me. It doesn't matter that they saw the sin or they're revealing the sin or they're pointing it out. None of that matters. What matters right now is that if I am being convicted, I remember the love that God has shown. He's proven his love to me. So this must be a good thing. Then I would embrace it. I'd encourage you too to embrace conviction. Embrace it. Not just like uh, dodge it. Get it. I mean, the quicker that you get convicted about areas, the quicker you can change. That period of adjustment, that sustained period of adjustment can, can, can happen relatively quickly. But the biggest problem you'd have is if you resist conviction, dodge it, don't want to hear where I'm wrong, don't want, don't want anyone telling me where I'm wrong, don't want the Lord making me uncomfortable. That sort of attitude is going to get you nowhere. We're talking about walking with the Lord Jesus Christ and preparing ourselves to be like that. Now, Another thing to encourage you that this chapter particularly talks about is that God disciplines those that he loves. Let's read it. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not? chasten think about that it means that you're a son or daughter of his in here the sons means both sexes son or daughter if you are being disciplined by god if he is revealing things to you that's a privilege turn the whole thing around look at the blessing that it is it's a privilege it means you really are a child of his how much what a great sign that is if you are not being challenged and you're not being disciplined then I would say you need to get on your knees and get before the Lord and beg him to start doing that. Because one of the greatest signs that you really are a child is you're not allowed to get away with things. That he will discipline you. He will bring conviction. He will want you to repent and turn around and walk a new direction in certain areas. He loves you. And one of the greatest signs 
is that he disciplines you. So if you feel rebuked, if you feel, you know, rebuked might seem like shouted at. Chastening means like being in trouble, being told off. If, you, if you're feeling like that, and that can happen sometimes, in a, it can be a season of that sometimes, then rejoice. Turn it around and look, yes, God's not mad at you in the sense of he's not fallen out with you. He's dealing with you as a child. With my children, my love for them never wavers when they've been naughty as they've been growing up. They're not really very naughty now, but maybe as they were growing up and they had to be trained and that they, they were learning things and maybe they needed telling off. But love for them never changed. I didn't suddenly decide I want nothing to do with this child anymore. My love for them caused me to bring discipline. My love for them caused me to bring correction. It's real love that does that. And if we're children of God, it doesn't mean he's, he's, he's fallen out with us. He doesn't love us anymore. It means he really does love us because he wants us to be right. In fact, good parents do discipline their children. That's real love. And those that don't, don't really love their children. So if you really love your, ch your children... You will discipline them because that's what our Father does. He brings discipline to his children simply because he loves them. Because he wants them to make it. He wants them to know him. He wants them to become Christ-like. He wants them to grow up. Most of all, he wants to spend eternity with them. Not just a few minutes at a time on this planet. So yes, he's going to bring discipline. But it's a positive. It's a good thing. Amen. One of the sections from this chapter is called Test Every Conclusion. And that is crucial. You test every conclusion by the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to go ev over every part of that section, but I'd encourage you to really look at it. Test every conclusion by the witness of the Holy Spirit. If I went round a church, went round my church, our church, if I went round our church and asked different people uh, what their opinion is on a certain subject, we probably would come up with many different answers. Well, that can't be right, can it? Why have we got so many denominations? Why have we got so many different churches believing so many different things? At some point, somewhere, someone has come to a conclusion that cannot be the truth. Only the Holy Spirit can reveal the truth. He is the truth revealer. So I would encourage you in any thought, any decision, anything that comes to your mind, any doctrine, anything that you think, especially the things you really believe, I'm not moving on this one, I know the truth on this and I ain't budging. They are dangerous places or dangerous concepts if they have not been tested by the Holy Spirit. I ain't interested in your opinion. That sounds really offensive, doesn't it? I am not interested in people's opinion. You cannot convince me with your opinion unless it is witnessed by the Holy Spirit, unless the Holy Spirit bears witness that I am not going to really believe what you say or take on board what you say. It happens to me often, it may happen to you. This is what you should believe. I know the truth in this area. I've studied this for, for years. I, I know it. If the Holy Spirit does not bear witness, it is not the truth and I am not accepting it. I'd encourage you to do the same. You only accept what's from God. Now we get into a bit of a mess when someone says, well, I've tested it with the Spirit and I've got a different answer to you. That could be possible if we don't both have the full light. That could be possible. But I'd encourage you to become familiar with the witness of the Holy Spirit. Him moving in your heart. Holy emotions as truth is revealed. If those holy emotions are not there from him, then I'd encourage you not to accept it. Amen? Amen. It's the same with deceived ministers that Joseph talks about. He's not judging ministers here. He's not judging certain pastors or TV preachers or certain denominations. That's not what he's doing. Joseph is just saying that there are deceived ministers out there, people who definitely use their mind to come to conclusions. And they're not purposely trying to work for the enemy. They're not purposely trying to work for Satan. But Satan has access to them because they're human, using a human reasoning system rather than the, the witness of the Holy Spirit. Be careful of those people. They look like spiritual people. They may know the right things to say in certain environments, but they may come up with clever ideas and fancy, fancy things that just do not line up with the Word of God as revealed by the Holy Spirit. Watch out for those people. Recently, I saw a post by uh, someone on, on Facebook. Uh, they had 17,000 followers, and he said, Constant fellowship with God is a lie. And the Holy Spirit was grieving. Yet many of the other things around that minister look good, seem good. But because that appeals to the flesh, that you, and he also mentioned that you don't have to change. Because of that appeals to the flesh, so many people were liking it. Now there were some, thankfully. 
that says this is not true. You can't call that a lie. It's the thing that Jesus died for. It's the thing that Jesus paid for. But that person with that statement is not working for Jesus Christ. He's working for Satan. Now that might seem offensive, but it's the truth. No way does God want his children to be deceived. So I'm not saying that you don't trust ministers. I'm not saying that you don't um, listen to them or you fall out with them. And when I say trust ministers, all our trust should be in God, but he may allow us to release some of that trust into people, but it's got to be him who's leading. But the point is that you must make sure that what you receive is from the Holy Spirit. There is so much rubbish out there. You put God channels on and all these different Christian TV channels and everyone's got a different opinion. Boring. I just want Jesus Christ and I just want his truth. I only want to know him. I don't even want to be right anymore. I'm not looking to be right for the fun of being right. The only reason I want to be right is because I want to know him. Amen? Amen. So watch out for those that would deceive you. And it's subtle. A lot of these modern places and modern churches deceive you with, you know, fancy talk of, of uh, lifestyle talks and all that sort of thing. We're the church of Jesus Christ. The only lifestyle I want is the lifestyle of Jesus or the lifestyle Jesus wants me to have. Amen. Now, there are other ministers that are called to encourage you, to equip you, to challenge you in areas that maybe need to change. But the purpose is love. And these may be what Joseph calls faithful ministers and their role based on Ephesians 4 is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry that we all may grow up to be Christ-like into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ actually. These are given for the furnishing, the equipping, the, you know, the, the encouragement and the gifting of the church that the church or the, the saints would do the work of the ministry. Now, these ministers would are people who want you to be a doer of the word. They want you to do it. They don't want you just to hear things. They don't just want you to, to, to take information on board. They want you to actually get it working. Why? Because they know the truth and they want the truth to work in your life. They want you to grow and they love Jesus and they love you. It doesn't mean every area they share is perfect. That's why you still test everything with the Holy Spirit. But these people are genuinely trained by the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, what I see is that most people who are trained by the Lord Jesus Christ in modern circles seem to be rebuffed but those that have gone through some sort of secular method of training are embraced i'd rather be a disciple of jesus and one of the things that they will do is to bring all sorts of correction including showing you ways in which your life is wrong now i'm going to read uh, this from the amplified bible but it's a commission that was given to me and it's been given to others and i just want you to understand one of the roles of a true minister of God, so that you understand what that person's role is in your life. So let's read it. 2 Timothy 4, verses 2 to 4. And this is in the Amplified. Herald and preach the word. Keep your sense of urgency. Stand by, be at hand and ready. Whether the opportunity seems to be favourable or unfavourable. Whether it's convenient or inconvenient, whether it's welcome or unwelcome, you as a preacher of the word are to show people in what way their lives are wrong and convince them, rebuking and correcting, warning and urging and encouraging them, being unflagging and inexhaustible in patience and teaching. So my role is to equip people, to rebuke people, to uh, encourage them yes encourage them but to show them ways in which their lives are, are wrong you've exhortation all the things that would just encourage you force you push you convict you to be like jesus that you would be doers of the word that you wouldn't be cast aside by fairy stories and fancy stories and the latest trends that you would stick with the teaching of jesus christ the truth that he reveals we just want to know him we want to know him we want to follow him. We want to know the truth. And Jesus is the truth. Amen. So be very careful about who you're following. And we're following Jesus, but in terms of ministry. Be very careful about who you look to and what you accept. You should only accept what the Holy Spirit reveals to you. And you should also, you may not understand this right now, but you should also be able to recognize an anointing on someone. And the difference between someone just speaking from the top of their head and someone being anointed 
is that an anointed person, when they share God's truths with you, if you're really listening, you will sense and feel the holy emotion that's coming from God as he is trying to draw you to himself. God, I mean, trying to draw you to himself. Look for those holy emotions in any teaching, in any preacher. And do not look for the dry text or speech that comes from the mind. Amen? Amen. One of the things that you need to remember from this chapter is that God judges the work that you do based on its origin. Whether that work came from you and your good ideas or whether that work came from the Lord Jesus Christ. If we truly are his servants, if he truly is our master, then we just do his bidding. We just do what he wants us to do. So I'd encourage you to make sure that you are not doing good works out of your carnal nature because it looks good. But you are doing the works that he wants you to do. Now some people take that to the extreme and don't have any good works because nope, God's not told me to do that. Well that can just be a sinful. Your responsibility, and there should be good works to go with your faith, there should be matching works to go with your faith, your responsibility is to serve Jesus and to follow him. Every work's going to be tested. Everything we've ever done in this life is going to be tested. The people that I kind of feel sorry for the most and compassionate to the most are those that have spent 20, 30, 40 years of their life doing something that they thought was a good idea and yet there's going to be no reward from God for that in the end. That is a travesty. So we must make sure that the works we're doing, the things we're doing, are the things that he's leading us into. Doing. We're all unique. This chapter tells us that we're all unique, that we've all got different parts to play, that Jesus has called us to his kingdom and that each of us are going to do something different, that he's going to prepare us to do works, the works that he has prepared. He's going to fit us into the body, into the right place to do exactly what we need to do. Maybe you're an answer to the world's problems. Maybe you're an answer to certain people's problems. At some way, somehow, you are definitely going to represent the Lord Jesus Christ, or at least you're called to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. Anything you've been through can work for your good if you love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. This chapter tells us that. So to be the people that God has called you to be, you've got to allow him to lead. Allow him to direct you. Allow him to show you. This world needs the version of you that Christ wants you to be. They need to see Jesus in you. It's a privilege to, to do that. and It's a privilege to represent Jesus. I'd encourage you to make the most of reading this chapter. If you find that the, you know, find it offensive that good works are, are not right or good works out of your own nature are not acceptable to God, if you find that offensive, then maybe study this chapter in detail and just ask the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth to you. I'm not trying to force the truth on you there. What I'm trying to say is just, just seek him on that. I want to be doing the works of my master. Jesus is Lord, isn't he? So let's do his works. Let's represent him on this planet. Let's become like him. There are so many exciting things in store. God's been training you way before you even knew it. He's been preparing you before you even realised he knew you before you were even born. That's how intimate he is about you. That's how much he knows about you. He knows what he planned. He knows what he knows what his purpose is. He knows what the best version of you is. So let's get on board with this process. Let's embrace conviction. Let's remember that we can be his children. And if we're chastised or disciplined, it's because he loves us. Let's embrace the process. Let's not just do good works. Let's do the good works that he ordains. And there should be some. There should be plenty. Not, not minimum. There should be plenty of good works. You just need to make sure that you check with him. And he's leading you in that. Amen. Amen. I'm looking forward to seeing the more of Christ in you. Or how you become as Christ leads you. I'm going to leave as usual with some questions. Or some points to look at. And, uh, and we'll join again for chapter 5. What were the two greatest commandments that Jesus gave? Do you love the Lord more than anyone or anything else in your life? Is Jesus Christ truly the Lord, supreme in authority? Do you see conviction as a blessing? Do you realize you're a child of his? According to Romans chapter 8 verse 28, Who do all things work together for good for? Do you have any doctrines that you're really confident about that need testing? Consider this statement. What you think you know stops you from knowing what God wants you to know now. Read the section on page 58 
entitled Faithful Ministers of God and discuss how that applies to your church. Consider this statement. God created you as a unique, one-of-a-kind member of the body of Christ. And finally, according to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13, what is the greatest purpose of every person, including you? <laughs>